I did get. Could you state your name and spell your last name and give me your date of birth? Modesto. Augusto. Modesto Rivera. M O D E S T O Rivera R I V E I A. They call me Junior. My birthday was May 17th, 54. Is that what you said? Yeah. My dad and my son's birthday is May 17th. Oh man. That's up. Weird. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and uh, uh, I think I got it yesterday, but where did you live and your dad had a grocery store? In Uptown. Okay. Oh, you, you want me to say that? Pop yeah, say it. Oh, yeah. Well, my, my, my personal experience in Rising Up Angry, well, I, I met James in 1969, Mike James in 1969 at the street corner on Leland Broadway with this kid, 15 years old, hanging out with my group of guys. But my father owned a store on 1114 West Leland. And in that, that store, he had a bookshelf. And we had Spanish novellas and comic books. We had three newspapers, Black Panthers, Palante, the Young Lords, and Rising Up Angry. One of the reasons my father had this newspaper, he was very anti-Daily. He hated the old man Daily because every time Daily would say Urban Renew, it was the Puerto Rican community. And he was a businessman, so every time he, Urban Renew came, he had to relocate. So he really not a, a favor of, uh, of Daily. But uh, my upbringing and the impact of Rising Up Angry to me and these other newspapers was in a neighborhood of Uptown that was economically deprived and just a social dumping ground for every program that the government wants to throw at us, there was a there was a lot of you know uh, the kids didn't have no no mentors and these were my mentors the newspapers not directly Shasha or Mike James or Fred Hampton but. The newspapers that they distributed, the newspapers that they published, were my political mentors, and these were the seed of my activism when I was in my stock room and business gets slow, and I had a, couple, I had a few minutes. I would glance to this newspaper, but I had this newspaper all the time with, with some of the kids in the neighborhood. You might get, them, get a glance at it for 10 minutes at a corner, but I had them stop. So I would, if I didn't catch a story today, didn't finish it, I'd catch it tomorrow, next week. So I knew most of the stories, and this is where my interest in activism became. And one of the reasons I stayed neutral, besides my father's being strict with me, but I stayed neutral and never had to join the street gang where a lot of other my friends did, because I, I, I learned the struggles of the American Indian, the Appalachian white, the African community, the African American community, and the Puerto Rican community. So I kind of understood the struggle at a very early age. And then now, being Puerto Rican, I, I interpreted it as an uptown that I realized that, I, and my father used to tell me this, but you know, when you're young, you don't understand this, that Puerto Ricans have three cultures, the white, the African, and the, and the Indian. And these three cultures make the, 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 the Puerto Rican nationality. So now is when I understand is that I had something in common with the American Indian in time. I had something in common with the Appalachian whites. So my father and my mother are mountain people. And most of my friends that I grew up from Appalachia and Ross, parents were from up, from uh, mountains. Appalachian mountains. Uh -huh. We were all mountains. You go to Puerto Rico, it's got the same landscape as what's in Virginia. Uh -huh. Just Puerto Rico, they live in the mountains. Yeah. Got the same landscape. It's a lot warmer. <laughs> I have friends come from West Virginia. And I have a couple of cousins that married people from West Virginia. And, uh, you know, they'll tell you they, they've never been to Puerto Rico. Like, ah, I can drive these mountains. And they, they're, they're our drivers. But, uh, and the blacks, being that we have an African culture in, in our nationality. With this understanding and, and, and these newspapers, you know, that was my way of dealing with uptown and, and the oppression. 
So by the time I went to the military and I came out, I already knew about the black man, the young lord. So when I just came out, I went and joined and worked on Shasha's campaign without any problem. You know, nice. Where'd you go to high school? Sin. For two years, 69, 70, and 71. Well, could you talk about relating as a, a teenager in high school on rising up angry or politics since you were in a Chicago high school? Okay, yeah. Uh, you were not. You were in New York. What? I, I, I want to hear a, a Chicago high schooler's memories. Okay, well, Sin High School, at that time, like most of the North Side was going through a transition. You had Boston, you had these new ethnic groups coming in. in the project, right? And uh, we had Chinatown. Uh -huh. We had students come from Chinatown, yeah. all the way from Sin High School. Sin was probably the most diverse high school. Right. So. And right now, it is definitely the most diverse. So all these white kids did not understand all this bus and all this, and, 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 and they just, it was, it was between the blacks, the China, Chinatown kids, and the white kids, they were just, they, you know, it, the, the school erupted in 68, especially with Martin Luther King. I didn't come into 69, but we had a rally for the first anniversary of uh, Martin Luther King fascination. My guy and TJO was the big white gang of uh, in Sin High School. They were, they were the ones we were with. TJO, Thorndale Jabbox. But right in the rally, right, right at the rally, they came in, the students were just getting up, and someone pulled a gun, and next thing you know, the riots came out, and they chopped the gun up in the air, thank God, and then they used to flash me. But it was just a riot. The police were coming buses to, to disrupt the fights in St. High School. They were diverse by Italian, Jewish. I mean, I never thought I'd bump into a Jewish street gang. I think the Divine Boys were actually What are they? Two. Uh -huh. What was the number? Yeah, they, and they became part of um, Thorn, the Thorndale Jackbox. Actually consolidated. They consolidated all, all the, the games. games. So all the C games. and D guys. I'm a group um, and, and the Joe Gancy and all this. Gancy, they would, we had a meeting. We, this was actually kind of a big deal internally for us. We didn't make it wasn't a big deal sort of in the grand scheme of the world, but for us internally, we were just starting out. We had the C and D guys and Clark and, De Clark and Devon, and uh, which was a little, which was not the major branch. It was a little branch of Thorndale, Jack, CJO. Kellis and Gansey were kind of hardcore guys. They were the hardest. They were the hardest. <laughs> and, and you know, they were in and out of prison. They were, they were more like uh, real gang guys. Our, our guys were kids. So they had a lot of clout. And so these guys are fighting the blacks. It's really getting racist. And so some of our guys from uh, CMD start saying, Look, we need some, they come to us and we need some guns. Now we've been just doing all this political education about how blacks and whites have the same struggle and exploitation. And they're, they're going along with it right on. Power of the people are going to Panther rallies. And they're saying, we need these guys. Can you help us get some guns? Before we, we got we got we got to fight the blacks in uh, San High School. So what, what about all the, the political classes we just did last week? You know, <laughs> where, where, where's, where's the all races stick together thing? Uh, yeah, well, you know, but the, some guy attack one of the girls. It's always it's always like a black guy attacked a white girl someplace. They may I don't know if it really happened or not. And so we went, Michael and I, and two other people went to talk to uh, Kellis and Gansel and, and asked them. We, we didn't know Cloud and Gordon were threatening. Well, we, we tried to give them the rap. We go, what are you going to do? You go to war here, we're just going to walk cars down on you. Got everybody fighting each other. They're going to come down on you. Yeah. Once you get everybody to like cool it, cool it out, just
just back off a little and just hope that it'll pull out and you don't have to make it worse. And they did. Now that doesn't mean, and you know, so we really did cool out this gang war up at Sin. And we wrote about it in the paper and we talked about it and we talked about it like we went. Two weeks later, they might have been right at it again. But it was a real short term victory. We didn't end racism. Uh, it's not nice. But for it, we did show that in a short term way, you can cool out a fight, you know, at least for a while. You know, he said a short term victory, but every short term period you had that wasn't as violent and that's true, you either saved the life. Or you, you, you neutralize hatred that will grow for 20, 30, 40 years. I still have friends that I grew up with. They live out in the boonies because they don't want nothing to do with no ethnic groups. But they're dear friends of mine, uh, best man in the world, you don't know who is. There's a piece of hatred that's still in their house. But they don't act out because of the rage or whatever. They have to go make a living. But they don't want to admit next to them. But whatever neutralization you did, that was a victim that you set for years. You didn't even show it too much. What happened with Joe Gassi and Alice was neutralize them with the murder rabbit that they got on Fox Street and they killed the market the grocer. They killed a grocer, they robbed the grocer, and they hanged him on the cop. And uh, Joe Gansey went to prison for life on that. Matter of fact, Channel 2020 did a, a thing on Joe Gansey in, in the 80s. And you know what for? He was the man that spent most time in the prison system in the state of Florida. I mean, to be honest, I, I didn't see, you know, when I met those guys, I didn't see them as... They weren't guys we were going to recruit. You know, we, we wanted tough guys. <laughs> and people were going to fight the cops and this and that. But these guys were crazy. They were mean. They were mean and crazy. And uh, you didn't have to be, you didn't have to be a uh, you know, minority. I mean... Were they an ethnic? Were they, they were white? Yeah. Yeah, I got the joke. Yeah, I think Gans was Italian. And well, tell us. I was a joke. No, I think you might have been Irish. Well, I'm always saying Jewish. It seems know. like they were all Jewish to me. It was so close to divine. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But the but kind of the you know from our point of view, there was that kind of distinction between. And I don't want to over overdo this, but between the dupers and the greeters, you know, in a neighbor in a, in a working class white neighborhood, you still had plenty of plenty of white kids. That's what's different about being a minority and white. In a white working class neighborhood, plenty of the white kids would go, would go to college. They'd go to, you know, Champagne, Circle Campus, or something like that. You know, or community college. And they were, and then there were the job types, and the, the, the jocks and the good students who parted their hair and kind of wore khaki pants or something. And, uh, and then there were the, the leather jackets and the greaser guys who were more into cars and working on gas stations. And so we were kind of, we identified with the, uh, the greaser culture, uh, which was in Chicago, which doesn't correlate necessarily to ethnic white ethics. You know, the greasers were all the white ethics. They were all greasers, though, they really. But up in that day. Hispanics, the Puerto Ricans, the Hillbilly, they all wear the Italian gear, the back kind of leather pants, the naval tees, and the, and the caprice leather jackets. It was, it was just a cold of the street. No matter what ethnic group, all the gangs were. Some had a little bit better, some didn't. You know, you ever see a Hillbilly from Tennessee wearing boots? They are good. I know you can see some of those pictures on the wall from the joint. You know, uh, and Kim Warren Lee, the, yeah, the, the, the uh, you know, the hillbilly guys, they, you know, it, it was that, that old rockabilly, yeah, yeah, you know, the rock, it was Conway, Conway, Tweedy, and Jerry Lee Lewis, and, um, and Elvis, you know, and, um, Johnny Cash, and, and Johnny Cash, they love it, I mean, Johnny Cash is, uh, icon, you know, well, he was doing the translation, he was actually talking about life, you know, 
I was pressing you to start doing it bad. Not later, but then again. Not, yeah. Uh, but going back to your question is that the uptown kids, we had American Indians, we had a couple of Japanese guys with us, we had the hillbillies and the poor people. Now the facts is so they, they stayed to themselves, they didn't want nothing to do with it. But, but we hang around the next at one. And uh, Thornton and Glenwood. And they used to call us just the uptown kids. The poor kids, the uptown kids. And we literally just stayed that in that section, that was our little section. But we had the we would be in the balcony at that time of when TJO came out with the gun and, and start shooting, you know, and, and disrupting the mountain of the people in We actually just sat you know, in that balcony, just watched, and we tried to stay as neutral as we can. For some reason, we had friends, I had friends from TJO. I had friends in Wilson, the Wilson boys. That, uh, they were the meanest and craziest I was about. I had friends in the Latin, I had family, family in the Latin Kings and Latin Eagles. I'm affiliated with the Latin Kings by blood. I, generations. I go back originally. The thing is that, thank God, I, and that's why I appreciate my kids and rice and family. Fred Hampton, Chacha, and the guys, they, they were able to raise my consciousness without, and the only color that I actually, was the color of the human heart. Just, but I was invited. I went to St. Thomas of Canterbury, and, and the Archdiocese we had what we call intervention, gang intervention at that time. One priest on each parish would be the gang intervention. And ours was Father Tilford. And at Sin High School, when TJO started consolidating into the gangs, he was concerned about the Margate boys. But most of them kids went the same time. What was the name of that? Margate, Margate Park. Named after Margate Park, was we call Margate Boys. But those kids went the same time, and they were being influenced by TJO. You know, drugs had a lot to do with it. And some of the parents got a hold of We had a big meeting of all the leaders of the community. The TJO, Delta, Turf, uh, uh, another hill group to represent. But I was selected to represent our group. Uh, X is one. We used to say X is one. But we were part of the uptown kids. And, since I knew the priest, he said, why are you doing this? I said, well, I told the kids that after we come to the meeting, and we, we had an invitation from the principal. Uh, is that your phone going off? Yeah, so I met Joe Cansley, you know. I got to sit down with him. No, not really Joe Cansley, but he was not in our meeting, he was not a student. But I met uh, a couple of the other teachers. I met, I always knew Joe Cansley from Bob. You mentioned this, what's this term, Exit One? Exit One, we used to call it. Thorndale and Glenwood was the exit of the city high school. Oh, the exit from the, the school. Exit One, right. Okay. I mean, just an exit, but it meant a lot. Yeah. A lot of that was like right. No, Exit One. The, the doors of the city high school, oh. Exit One. Exit One, Exit Two, Exit Three, Exit Four? So just an exit, one exit. Okay. Was, I think they had three doors, two doors, eight doors. But it was an exit. And then we tell you, Mickey and exit. Well, we had 60, over 100 guys in there. We had a good one. That's one of the other reasons we say, good one. But what I'm saying, I, I think more ours were more economic than dealing with the kids that came to the north and died. We knew, we, we knew we were the kids. And we knew we had no organized sports, no little league, no, no one coming and say, you know, what sponsor you, wear these uniforms like they did at the park. We didn't have none of that. We had a backyard, fake dinner, softball, drink beer, smoke pot. 
But we didn't have organized sports. We didn't, we didn't come to our neighborhood to organize. But we organized fighting sports. You know, that, 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 that. And we had American Indians, very, very, uh, a lot of American Indians. We had the large population in the city of American Indians. Back then, it might even be the largest population of any community in the country, I think. Outside the reservation. Outside the reservation. Any reservation. Right. Were, they, were they from Optimum. one tribe or one area, or they just all from all over? Optimum. If you had 700... No, what, Indian, Indian Indians Indian from all over the U.S.? Indians left the reservation. Oh, oh they came from everywhere. No. Most of them came from Minnesota and Wisconsin. You know, it's like, uh, like all the, all the uh, European immigrants all went to the Lower East Side in, in New York. Indians all came from up down. Kicked up down. There's American Indian centers. Uh, yeah, the American Indian Center on uh, Wilson Avenue, they're, they're there. They had their own bars. So a lot of the bars were served them. They had their own bars. The TP, the Tomahawk, the H. You name it. Uh, my place. Uh, Buck Fussy. Red, well, Red Rooster was the only one. Buck Fussy. Buck Fussy. But the uh, audience. You know, you know, point with. This is, I know it's all about changing, changing the subject off, off a little bit. But at this time also, you, you asked something, you said something about Fred Hansen. And, and the important thing. I think we haven't mentioned the importance of Fred Hampton enough. Fred Hampton was more than just that he was the leader of the Panthers, just like Josh Dowd. He's a very special guy, you say he's the one who influenced John Spoke. But he would speak, give it to just meet somebody that, you know, there's just no question about who should be the leader here. Fred Hampton, you get a bunch of people say, well, who should be in charge? No question, Fred, Jim, Fred. And he would have these little rallies, even in the church, in the, in, uh, down the country, other places, uh, or campus, uh, community college, and it would pack these rallies, and he would, it was, he was like, this and some radical politics, but even better. I mean, he would do, do his thing, I am a revolutionary, and get a thousand people chanting, and you can chase a revolutionary, and he and he met, he was he was so fantastic. You'd memorize his lines. You'd, you know, uh, you know. Some people said Rap Brown was like that in the early days, but I never heard, heard him speak really big. Uh, Fred Hampton just captured the hearts and minds of everybody, and that's why they, that's why they killed him. But we used to bring people, white kids, you know, to a Panther rally, and you get them to listen to Fred, and it was entertaining, but it was educational. And he would have you laughing and screaming and angry, and you know, he'd talk about, um, you know, breakfast for children program, and all these things. And so you, you wonder what kind of political. On one level, that is the best form of political education if we could bring people to a Panther rally. Here, Fred Hampton, and they, there was nobody to replace Fred. And they told him, Bobby Rush is a great guy, but he's kind of quiet. You know, but no, and I, I used to go and I worked in the factory. And we had a group of people, mostly black, and we used to go on Friday afternoon after work to the Panthers. And uh, about eight of us, mostly, mostly, uh, and the only one I had uh, one of like political education class, eight or ten guys in the factory to go talk to Fred Hampton. And, and just watching him in the office, people coming and going, picking up newspapers, security, things going on. He was just in charge, you know. He just, to me, and he's exactly my age. Uh, he was 21, I was 21. And, um, like, the difference. I just feel like he could command an army, you know, and I could just, I, I'm smart, I'm like Fred, Fred, <laughs> Fred was just, he was, he's my dad, my, if I think of, like, who can I think of that I haven't met, a real leader, it was Fred, he was, I think, 22 when, when he was killed, and it, um, I mean, he would, if, if he had lived, 
he would be a national, nationally known, you know, uh, major singer. He was just that good. And uh, you just can't overstate how, how good Fred was. It was. There was no question, nobody ever said. You never heard anybody ever say anything about Fred Hampton. His stories were funny, you know. He, he went to jail for robbing an ice cream truck and giving a, a white ice cream truck driver or something. And he, he uh, stopped them and he took the ice cream and gave it out to the kids in the neighborhood. And uh, $55 worth of ice cream. And he went to jail. That's where he met Chacha? No, that, that's Fred. Fred? And, oh, and that's, where, that's probably where he met Chacha. I, I don't really know where he met him, but I know Chacha tells me the story all the time. This is how he met him. He was in jail. But I don't it's, know if it was ice cream. But it's, uh, you know, just to put, a, put in a historical plug, that if there was one person that, uh, you know, that we admired more than anybody else, uh, it, it was Fred Hampton. And that's why, you know, you see there's the oh, area is right there. You know, a lot of people are real nice, but it was Fred Hampton that actually came up with the concept of Rainbow Coalition. Rainbow Coalition. Uh, Jesse Jackson. No, I think you're right. I think uh, Fred, Fred, Fred did it first, and then, and then just Jackson just was the same. But not to take anything away from Fred. Well, uh, compare him to, to Obama. He's a great speaker, he gets people laughing, but obviously yeah. that doesn't have. Not that kind of speaker. You're right, it, it, there's no comparison. I mean, Fred was fiery. Obama's uh, is a polished mainstream leader of the United States government. Uh, Fred was a revolutionary. Yeah, he didn't. He, there was no question. Fred, I am a revolutionary. Right. He didn't have to hide behind the cold words. He just used what he did. I remember when he used to say, uh, "Live with the people, struggle with the people, die with them." That's the kind of way you used to be the beginner or end of the and you know, you didn't have to accuse him of being a socialist, you know, he said, we got uh, free breakfast, you know, and then you have uh, free housing, and free health care, and we can have freedom. And, you know, when he talked about socialism, he said, you, got, you go up to the ladies in the neighborhood and say, do you like socialism? And they say, and they say no, no, I don't like socialism, I'm afraid of socialism. And then you say, do you like free breakfast, do you like free health care? And they say, oh yeah, we like that. Why well, that's socialism. Well, I guess we like socialism. <laughs> and he could, you know, he, he, it's like he was singing it. It was, um, it, it was an, and I, I mean, he had, he didn't come from nowhere. You know, Fred didn't, just wasn't born at the age of 20, you know, um, founding the black What was his background? Did you know? He came from Maywood. Uh, and I think he had stuff to do with the early civil rights stuff, you know. Uh, when he was in high school, he organized this high school, citywide high school strike, which I don't remember the details of. It was about 60, 1965, 66, 67, somewhere in there. It was a high school student strike, and he, he was a leader of that. I think he was, um, there was James, Reverend James Bevel in the civil rights movement. He might have gone south with him. And I think he was mentored by, you know, people we never heard of, maybe ministers. He had a real uh, uh, preacher, uh, you know, Southern Baptist black preacher style to his speaking. But the content was totally, totally political and, and not, not religious at all. But the style was the most fiery um, Baptist preacher kind of style. And that was original. That was, I can't think of anybody else who, uh, who did that. There was people who imitated Fred, but there wasn't anybody else like that. Did he ever come and talk rising up angry? He, he actually never, he never, he never, he, we had, like, uh, a deputy like Chaka would come talk, uh, Bobby Rush maybe. Uh, he got killed, right? He was killed. Part of the he, 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 he was killed, um, February, and it December, was December 4th, 1969, and um, the first issue of our paper came out in July of uh, 1969. So, 
we were in the early stages, and, uh, uh, and and they were busy. You know, then we we worked with them a little bit. I don't know. I might have, we might have had some meetings with them, but it was more on a like I I would always say a representative to a coalition. You could Bobby Seal, chairman of the. National